My name is uh, Chantal Bernier, and uh, I'm with my colleague uh, Karl Schrober. And uh, what we'd like to do today is uh, bring you up to date on some legislative and other developments in the area of privacy. And Karl will focus on Castle. Uh, the title I've chosen here is uh, Challenges and Strategies for Decision Makers. There's a reason I specifically chose the word decision makers. Is that my objective right now is not that you will get out of here in an hour and a half knowing everything about privacy law. Obviously, it's impossible. Um, but also because I really hope that you have the decision-making pointers that will let you identify the issues and get the answer that you need. So I hope to share with you the dynamics of privacy law right now. So the focus is really how is the landscape changing and how is this impacting you as decision makers? So a few working assumptions, obviously based on my experience. So I say assumptions, but actually uh, they're more a premise than an assumption. The first thing I have found through my years as regulator, as now at outside counsel, is that privacy risks and issues are always systemic. And I've really scratched my head to find one occasion where the privacy breach, the privacy incident, was isolated, could have been described as non-systemic. And the closest I found to that is maybe, because the case has not been heard yet on substance, but Evans versus Scotia Bank. Are you familiar with Evans versus Scotia? Class action, just certified. What happened is that in Scotia, an employee called Richard Wilson unlawfully accessed the files, the accounts of many of Scotia's clients, passed on that personal information to his girlfriend who used it to defraud hundreds of Scotia Bank clients. And so now Evans is the point person for the class action. And we'll have to see whether the court on substance recognizes that Scotia did have a vicarious liability for Richard Wilson's uh, actions. Obviously, the argument of Evans and the class action plaintiffs is that the bank had a duty to check him had a duty to imply good access controls and monitor access to avoid what he did. So even if we do get that conclusion from that case that the bank is responsible, well then, again, even that possible incident which we could call isolated would not be. It would be, yet again, part of a system. And I have told you my bias. I think it is always systemic, because even if Scotia was not negligent in the way that it monitored Richard Wilson and the other employees, still what comes out of the results is that it should have monitored even more. And throughout my presentation, I will share with you my experience uh, where indeed I have found that monitoring was just not sufficient. How many here from banks? Okay, so banks, absolutely the poster boys or girls for uh, privacy protection, but also the poster, the poster boys and girls for employee indiscretion. So I'll uh, look at, talk about that in a moment. The second working assumption, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to create a bit of suspense there. Um, and uh, the other thing as I, that I want to mention is how vulnerabilities are cross-sectoral. There isn't one sector that can say, we're fine. Um, I remember going speaking to the chambers of commerce across Canada, where we had jurisdiction, because what we found was that the, senior, the small and medium business just were not up on privacy. 
So I went through, uh, you know, all the Maritimes and in mean, Saskatchewan and, you know, everywhere where we had jurisdiction and I would have be keynote speaker on all these lunches at the Chamber of Commerce. And at one of these lunches, one guy comes up to me and says, oh, nice to meet you. Of course, I have zero interest in privacy. I just came here because I come to all the lunches. I thought, well, I guess his business is not doing very well, that he would go for a free lunch about something that he truly has no interest in. But I kept that to myself, and I said, well, would you know, what do you mean that uh, don't you have personal information? Like, what do you do? Or he says, we renovate kitchens. Okay, I know that there is part of the construction uh, business that works without credit cards or anything, but usually they do. And it, I was amazed that this guy had no idea that he could definitely be a victim of an attack. He has credit card numbers on his computer, and that's very helpful. And if you look at the Target breach, that's how it happened. They didn't attack Target. They attacked a smaller supplier to Target, and the uh, attack went, made its way to the uh, center. So absolutely, technological volatility is a cross-sectoral and needs to be taken into account. There are new law enforcement powers for everyone. Um, you know, this is C51, for example. And the value of data has increased for everyone. Business intelligence for the private sector, governance intelligence for the public sector. So, for example, the long-form census is going to be reinstated now. By the way, the Office of the Privacy Commission of Canada had always said that the long-form census was not privacy intrusive. You may recall that the Conservative government had canned it for that reason. We were on the record saying, no, it was not a privacy violation, number one, because it was in a proper balance of public and private interest, secondly, because there was effective anonymization, and thirdly, because there was security of the information. So that's an example of data value for government. Data value for the business sector, well, that's <coughs> online behavioral advertising, for example. It's all the data monetization. It's business intelligence. Who shops at our businesses, right? So there you are. The value of data needs to be balanced with privacy interests. So what are the new risks? Uh, you will find on our website an article I wrote called Main Vulnerabilities and Best Practices in Data Protection. I wrote this article a few weeks after the end of my term as privacy commissioner because I thought I'd like to help business by just distilling what I have seen after five and a half years of investigations and auditing and, and receiving breach notification, even if they did not lead to investigations. What have I seen as the main tripping points? And I've distilled it to three. The first one, underestimation of risk, like that's the guy who came to me and said, I really just came for the free lunch because I have no issue with privacy. The second one is to fail to see privacy as a uh, risk management uh, for the organization. Can you imagine a CEO asked, well, how is your budget doing? And he would say or she would say, oh, I don't know, but I have a great CFO who can tell you. No, you can't imagine that, can you? But it happens with privacy. Do you have proper controls? Do you have proper privacy policies? Oh, I don't know, but I have a great CPO. I have a great CIO, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, um, incidents like the CEO of Target losing his job, as well as the CSO and the CIO, uh, the CEO of Ashley Madison losing his job, the VP of Sony Entertainment losing her job, and so on and so forth, they're, you know, they're cluing in now that it is an organizational challenge. But this is something that truly needs to be ingrained and that I would urge you to go back to your organizations with that approach if you truly want to protect your organization. And the third uh, vulnerability, cross-cutting, is insider threat. Um, either human error, for example, in government, uh, Development Social uh, Canada with the uh, Department of Justice, they had a joint investigation. Someone lost a USB key unencrypted. And where the error came, and I could go through so many other areas, but this is just one example. The employee thought that an unencrypted USB key was still more protected than email. So 
you know, lack of digital literacy, very important to take care of. Employee indiscretion uh, is, as I said a moment ago, a big problem. And there are two that have been made public. One is a bank, uh, and that's the uh, case of Teague versus Jones. Anyone familiar with Teague versus Jones? You are. Okay, um, and you are as well. So in a nutshell, love triangle, by the way, big, big privacy risk. Think twice about it. <laughs> um, so this is the fact uh, we have new girlfriend who goes into, she's a bank employee, sorry. She's a bank employee. It's not that bank employees are bad, it's that banks have really, really very important, sensitive data, very useful data. So, uh, Tsig is a bank employee. She goes into the bank account information of Jones, who happens to be an employee of the same bank, but it's not an employment issue, because Tsig is the new girlfriend of Jones' former husband, because obviously the husband wants to know what Jones really has for money, because obviously, like many couples who go through a divorce, they are doing financial, you know, they have financial issues. <laughs> and what is very interesting legally is that the court recognized the tort of intrusion upon seclusion, meaning the mere fact without any harm, material harm, the court said the mere violation of privacy constitutes harm and is an actionable tort. So this is not only an example of indiscretion, but an example now of the legal implications of indiscretion. The other one that was very much in the news, and that one I am sure you heard of it. Has anyone heard of the indiscretion in Rob Ford's patient's file? Okay. So, what you may not know is that the OIPC actually uh, investigated, and in a few moments, I will give you what the mitigation strategies are there. But these are examples of indiscretion. So those are the new risks. The new technologies also bring uh, new risks. So the first one is cloud computing. There are two main risks in relation to cloud computing. One is technological, and the other one is legal. Technologically, if you don't go with a reliable cloud, you could lose control over the data. So make sure you go with, to a reliable cloud, but I will get to that when I get to mitigation strategies. The second one is data residency requirements. There are, in Canada, two jurisdictions, BC and Nova Scotia, that do not allow public bodies to transfer data outside of Canada. In other words, if you are a company that is a contractor with departments in BC or in Nova Scotia, and you have servers in the US, they will have an issue doing business with you. What is uh, required there is individual consent. But there is, they do agree, in fact, there is a specific report of finding in BC where the commissioner says a click to agree is enough, but you need to know that in these two circumstances, there are data residency requirements, and of course, if your cloud, as many clouds are, is in the US, you will need to contend with that, and that's a legal implication. The second one is BYOD, bring your own device. Do you have in your organizations bring your own device policies? You do? Okay, I see quite a few heads nodding. Um, this is mainly a cybersecurity risk people mixing their personal and professional information on the same device, devices that may not have the level of cybersecurity that is required to protect the sensitivity of the organization's information, uh, devices that may have apps that could weaken further the technological infrastructure, huge issue, needs a policy. Absolutely, organizations need to decide, first of all, can we afford to allow BYOD? And if we do, these are the terms. And it is, in best practice, the businesses that I have seen do this best have an agreement signed by each employee 
on the terms and conditions of BYOD. And then mobile also uh, safeguards issue because, as we've said, um, they have huge impact. So you lose a tiny little key and you've got 60,000 people's information there. And it could be very, I mean, we've seen it, right? You read the news like I do. And so encryption is an obvious uh, mitigation strategy there. But let's move then to the mitigation strategies. The very first one, the prophylactic, the hygiene, the basic hygiene is strong governance. So I'm going to tell you the story here of our investigation of uh, Google Wi-Fi. Were you with us already when, when we did that, Carl, uh, the OPC? I arrived after. You arrived after. Oh, you missed, you missed, missed the, the action. Yeah, that was really big. So in a nutshell, the story, you all know Google Street View, right? This is when they drive around and they film and then we can go on the internet and check those houses we wanted to rent for the summer and discover that it's a real slum or whatever. Well, as they were doing that, they had a code in the Street View program that was meant to identify Wi-Fi hotspots. It had been developed by an engineer who on his and or her free time, because Google has 20% that it gives as free time to its engineers it's kind of the moonshot, blue skying, whatever you want to call it. This is creative time. And in his or her time, develop this code without checking for privacy implications. It turns out that it captured content, Wi-Fi content, entire emails. The Hamburg Data Protection Authority is the one who found out, who was alerted to it. 12 of us went after Google. So I sent some technologists to Mountain View. They did find Canadian data, did a commission-initiated investigation. All 12 investigations found the same thing, which, of course, shows to you how redundant it was. But that's another matter altogether. Um, <laughs> the, the point is, but we were all right. We all found the same thing. So the fact that it was, let's say, accidental, that Google did not have the intention of gathering this, even if you accept that, they had a huge governance breakdown because they did not have the mechanisms to make sure that this engineer would be checked before he or she would put any code on technology that captures personal information, because Street View films, oh yes, they blur the faces, they, we, you know, actually the OPC and others have imposed some privacy limitations, but still, the, the picking up the Wi-Fi communications, that was not part of the deal. And so this is a very important example, in my view, of a highly sophisticated, very well-resourced organization that fell flat on governance, on failing to see privacy as a corporate risk issue that must be managed corporately through, how do you manage any corporate issue? Through an effective, clear governance structure. That's example one. Then example two is about strong implementation. Now, in the second example, ESDC as it then was, it's been renamed after the new government, they had the Cadillac of implementation. Um, we used to refer them, you know, departments would say, how should I organize? We'd say, go see ESDC. They, they really have it well done. But when they lost a hard disk containing the sensitive information, financial, of 583,000 Canadians, student loans information, uh, we realized that that beautiful Cadillac actually was not driven by someone who had a license. That was the problem. So what do we discover? That the hard disk was left in a drawer that did have a lock-in key, except they would keep the key in the lock because then it was easier to find. <laughs> it was not encrypted. It was not identified. You could not know by looking at it what was on it. It was not on any registry where it would be in the custody of so-and-so. And so someone obviously just took it, used it for something else, and it's never been found again. And so 
the conclusion of the report, and the report, I've asked my staff then to write it as a manual, a reference manual for everyone else. So you may want to look into that, and it will really show you what to do and what not to do uh, in terms of once you've got your great governance and your great policies, how you make sure it trickles down to senior management being seized and managers uh, overseeing the implementation and staff understanding their obligations. So strong implementation. Personnel security is also very important. And this where is when I go back to the issue of Rob Ford. So um, as you know, the Office of the uh, Information Privacy Commission of Ontario did investigate, did find that there was unauthorized access. What's more important is what recommendations did he make? So first of all, he said there has to be clear policies within an organization to make sure staff understand their obligation with respect to personal information. I would go a bit further. I have a client who asked me to do a privacy policy for their inside group. They are a super innovative, high, high tech organization. And so I gave them an example of, you know, all the rules. And they said, oh, no, no, we, we don't like rules. Like these are employees who come to work with their jeans under their bum, you know, so nah, don't like rules. Uh, okay, so that really threw me for a spin. And then I realized, well, wait a minute. No, 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 the real basis is ethics, formulated as ethics. And that's why, for example, banks that have phenomenal rules and also good ethics still have bad apples once in a while. One, because they have this treasure trove of information and because it has to be pushed as a fundamental right and awareness of personal integrity being at stake. Detection mechanisms, so very important to have audit trails, to have warnings, early advance warnings of unauthorized access, and to monitor the audit trails. Also, there has to be clear access restrictions. It's got to be on the basis of need to know. In fact, since then, FIPA, Ontario Personal Health Information Protection Act, has been amended to restrict who the circle of care is, and therefore, who can look at a patient's file. Interestingly, and I open a parenthesis, I'm a member of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons. Don't worry, I don't do any operations or anything. I guess they needed a lawyer. And when this was adopted, they were incensed. They said, oh my God, that means we will not be able to share personal information about patients with our students. And I went, oh my God, you did that? <laughs> <sighs> so, uh, culture, huge, huge issue. You see, culture is very important here. So, access controls. The other thing is that there's got to be effective breach response. Things will happen. You need to be ready to take care of it. And disciplinary action. This is a big deal. And if you believe it's a big deal, you got to put your money where your mouth is. So the uh, report of the um, OIPC is interesting in that regard. Organizational accountability structure. So how does the organization organize itself to manage any risk? Well, apply it to privacy. So number one, the board. The board has a duty of care, a duty of oversight. Well, they've got to know something about privacy They've got to at least know what questions to ask. And by the way, I've just published an article on that, Board Oversight for Privacy, where I explain exactly how, uh, the, what I believe their duty is. Secondly, the CEO. The CEO is in charge of that, as he's in charge or she's in charge of every risk management in the organization. Then, PIPEDA. And the provincial legislation requires that there be a designated official, a chief privacy officer, or call it what you will, but someone who is responsible for internal privacy compliance in the organization. That person's name must be uh, made public, and it must work hand-in-hand -hand with the CIO. And I was just at a conference in South America last week where the Latin American head of MasterCard was there. And I was so gratified to hear him say this over and over again. And MasterCard, 
they really need to take care of information, right? Because you know, if they don't, they might as well just brush up their CVs and look for another job. So, and he was saying exactly that. The CIO and the CPO need to work hand in hand. Cybersecurity is a subset of privacy. It's a way you protect the information you have, but what you can have and how you can use it, that's privacy, and the two of them must work together. And the line managers, of course, must supervise the implementation of the policies, and the staff must uh, obviously follow it. So let's move then to cloud. Um, the risk on cloud, to me, is only on unreliable clouds, technologically. Uh, but if you also want to buttress your due diligence and your control over data on cloud, go with an ISO 27018 certified cloud. Last time I checked, uh, there were five. Microsoft, Dropbox, <coughs> Google, Apple, and Amazon are ISO 27018 certified. That is a good mitigating strategy. BYOD, if you look at what the OPC and BC and Alberta privacy commissioners have uh, issued this summer in August, good tip on how to develop a BYOD policy. And then on mobile devices, the OPC also has some interesting guidance. And then we'll move to legal developments, and this is where I'm going to ask Carl to jump in to talk about CASEL, and I will come back afterwards to talk about the other uh, legal developments that impact upon privacy law. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to interject for some minutes, and I will give it back to Chantal uh, to discuss about the developments in the law that everyone loves to hate, Canada's anti-spam legislation. <clears throat> We have to go back. Um, he had arranged it for it to be the next. The uh, okay. Let's. Oh. What do we have to do? No, it's not it. Sorry. No. It's. Um, there it is. Castle. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Shift F5. Yeah, just put the cursor there and it should work. All right. Okay. How many lawyers did it take to do that? <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to quickly discuss some. There we go. Some investigations that came out this year under spam. Uh, the investigations under the unsolicited telecommunications. Of course, we'll talk about some lessons and takeaways for organizations and under those. And of course, there was the new computer program installation legislation that took effect earlier this year. Uh, before we get to the CRTC's enforcement activities of 2015, uh, it should be good to just quickly brush up on the core requirements that we're going to be discussing a lot for commercial electronic messages or CEMs. Um, consent, whether it's going to be express consent or you're going to be relying on some sort of implied consent such as an existing business relationship. There'll be technical requirements such as identification, content such as the name, an address, and a phone number, email, or website. They're very specific. And then of course a proper unscribe mechanism that is prominent and functions and executes an unsubscribe request within 10 days. On March 15, 2015, it was announced that CompuFinder was going to be the first target by the CRTC with a $1.1 million AMP for allegedly sending CEMs to businesses without consent and for sending CEMs with un unsubscribe mechanisms that did not function properly. Of particular importance is that these CEMs promoted various training courses to businesses, often related to topics such as management, social media, professional development. And it was also noted in their notice of violation that there was a high amount of complaints regarding CopyFinder, about 26% within that industry sector. 
This case, however, brought more confusion to an already complex area of law, where it was understood that there were certain exemptions that could be relied upon for organizations who were sending CEMs to other organizations. So we're a little left unclear about how the CRTC is interpreting two important exceptions that organizations should be able to rely upon. The first is conspicuous publication. So if an organization is going to rely on implied consent under Section 9b, that if you're going to send it a CEM to an organization who has conspicuously published their email, such as on their website, and there's no language saying that they do not want to receive CEMs, and that the CEMs you do send are actually relevant to that organization, um, or actually, as the language says, are relevant to the person's business role, function, or duties in a business or official capacity. And the second exception that exists that we believe organizations should be able to rely upon is in the regulations, which is 3A2, whereas a CEB is sent to an employee or a representative of another organization, and those organizations have a relationship, and the electronic message concerns the activities of that organization. So the notice of violation from the CRTC doesn't have a lot of details, and that is a consistent problem with the notice of violations that are sent out of CRTC. And we are left confused as to why these exceptions do not exclude CompuFinder. So we are still unsure of how CRTC is interpreting what it means for a CM to be relevant to a person's business role, function, or duties in a business or official capacity, uh, which is a key factor in determining whether an organization can rely on a conspicuous publication of electronic address, or in the case of, you know, someone provides you their business card information, which has your email address on that, if they can rely on that. Similarly, we're still left confused in how the CRT is interpreting if an organization has, if the organizations have a relationship, mm -hmm. and how they are interpreting the message concerns the activities of the organization. However, reading between the lines, it seems that CompuFinder, um, you know, was probably ignoring the CRTC, and maybe not the most cooperative. That same month, uh, the CRTC announced its investigation and subsequent undertaking with Plenty of Fish, the online dating website. And in this case, the CRTC alleged technical violations against Plenty of Fish as the CMs it sent did not have an unsubscribe mechanism that was clearly and prominently set out. Unfortunately, the CRTC did not provide details on why the unsubscribe mechanisms were not prominent or clearly set out. As well, Planet Fish was sending out CMs which could not be readily performed, uh, which I we presume is that they did not unsubscribe when a person requested to be unsubscribed. However, the interesting issue with in the Planet Fish case, and again, one that adds confusion, to this piece of legislation is that emails were sent to users of Plenty of Fish, notifying users of services available through the <laughs> registration of the dating site. So under 6.1 and 6.2 of CASEL, CEMs are prohibited unless you have consent and the messages in the prescribed forms. So it would seem that these are not prohibited CEMs, but instead Plenty of Fish should be able to rely on the exception provision of 66D1, in which a CM sole provides notification of factual information um, regarding the ongoing use or purchase of a product or service um, to the in individual, like under through a subscription or membership or an account that you have with that company. So basically, as such, email sent to an account, an account user, sorry, a plenty of fish, to notify them about services available through their account membership of the dating site should meet the exception provision as it provides information about your ongoing account. Or the CRTC is suggesting that even if the CM does fall under the exception which I just described, that CM still needs to comply with the technical requirements that they still need to be include a clear, prominent, and working mechanism. Either way, this may highlight a confusion between what we understand to be spam and what consumers understand to be spam, uh, leading them to subsequently go and complain. What is an email marketing effort by an organization may be viewed as spam by the consumer. So given this disconnect, organizations need to carefully review their communications efforts and consider the expectations of the 
consumers and decide whether to rely on an express consent model that is consistent with their expectations. Finally, it seems that settling quickly may have its advantages. So if the CRTC does catch an organization be non-compliant and assume that you are willing to admit fault and public cooperate to make changes, it will help in the CRTC be more lenient with regards to fines. The next announced spam investigation was in June of 2015 by the CRTC against Porter, and Porter allegedly sent commercial emails with various technical violations, including emails with no unsubscribe mechanism, emails lacking complete contact information, one complaint an unsubscribe request was not given effect within the legislated 10 business days, and one confirmed complaint by the CRTC involved an unsubscribe mechanism that was not clear and prominent. However, this time, we got details from the CRTC and how they came to that conclusion. And in this case, the CRTC found that this particular email had two unsubscribe links. One of them did not work. And according to the CRTC, the unsubscribe mechanism was not clear because it was not set out and it was not apparent which link was functional. The significant violation, however, and likely the, the main reason Porter was being punished here was in regards to Porter's inability to provide, um, to provide, to prove and obtain consent, and the settlement amount compared to Plenty of Fish is probably relevant and reflects that. So Porter was unable to provide records of consent, whether it was by express consent or an implied consent for each email address it was sending, and thus it was unable to prove if it had consent to send those emails. The CRTC took the opportunity to underscore their position that senders need to provide specific records of how consent was obtained for each email address, as it is not sufficient for organizations to rely on general business practices or policies as proof of consent. Organizations will want to ensure they record every consent, whether it's express or implied, and be prepared for when those consents will expire because relying on an outdated record of consent will pose future risks for the organization. So just to recap for those who are online, I've, I believe I answered the question properly. The question is whether we have to track the consents for all consents we received prior to Castle coming in. Um, there is like a transition period that was offered where we can rely on the implied consent, and that will be coming away eventually. But as of this past, I think it's coming a year and a half now, we need to be recording these consents and be prepared because as the... Um, as these just come forward, we'll have to start facing possible actions from individuals. Um, further, each of these cases kind of highlights that the form also matters and that's detecting requirements under the CRT's electronic commerce protections regulations of how CMs are set out is important and they will be scrutinized. And so we need to make sure that you know, they are clear and prominent and as we're slowly understanding what clear and prominent means. Um, and in the Porter scenario, Porter already had a compliance program, but under the undertaking was required to update and review it, include training to its employees. Um, but regardless, all these cases enforce the need for an organization to have some kind of compliance program in place that will hopefully, hopefully pre prevent these issues, but also in the event of becoming involved with a CRTC investigation will be crucial for an organization to rely on the due diligence defense that is available under CASEL. And as in the case for Porter, uh, a reminder that organizations are accountable for the contracting uh, third parties who send out these CMs on behalf of their organizations. Um, as I'll discuss in the next slide, it was a busy year for the CRTC under the unsolicited telecommunications investigations. But first, just a, a quick review of the requirements for organizations or third parties. Uh, providers who act on their behalf who send out telecommunications as part of their marketing or communication strategy. Um, in order to honor Canadians' desire not to be called, um, telemarketers must register and, if necessary, subscribe to the National Do Not Call list 
and pay the fees as applicable. Um, there are also rules to uh, abide by, such as identifying the name of the caller, identifying the, the organization, what's the purpose of the call, and upon request provide a toll-free number or a local number. You need to do, the originating number, originating number needs to be displayed. Um, you can only call within restricted hours. You have to adhere to the national do not call list. And if your organization has your own internal do not call list, you need to abide by that. And as consistently important, organizations need to keep records, such as proof of subscriptions to the national do not call list, or records of actual abandonment rates, uh, and retain them for a period of three years. And if you get a request, you need to be able to provide those documents within 30 days to the commission. So on this slide is four of the 25 unsolicited telecommunications investigations that the CRTC had in 2015. Um, the first, Hamal, or which was operating as telelisting, had repeated violations of Section 10, which um, prevented a telemarketer or a client of a telemarketer to sell, rent, or otherwise disclose data from the national do not call list, whether it's for profit or not, to anyone outside their organization. And Telestin allegedly and repeatedly resold access to the do not call list to real estate agents and brokers. And those same real estate agents and brokers, most of which um, were not registered or had subscribed to the national do not call list. With Metroland, um, they used an automatic dial in announce device and to make unsolicited calls from January 4th, 2012 to July 31st, 2013. And Metroland's identification messages had some technical issues, which they were not compliant with, and did not include a toll-free number, did not include a local number, did not have a mailing address at the beginning of telecommunication, and Metroland had no um, compliance program in place whatsoever. And the last two at the bottom of the slide are examples uh, or are investigations of companies from the United States who are contacting Canadians. Um, Rainmaker was out of Arizona and Caribbean Cruise Lines out of Florida. And these were joint investigations with the Federal Trade Commission. Rainmaker um, was had ins involved unsolicited, telemar unsolicited telemarketing calls to offer lower credit rates to Canadians who were actually on the do not call list. Uh, Rainmaker itself, <laughs> as company was not registered, and they did not provide a toll-free number to be reached at. And Caribbean Cruise Line, you want to cruise? I'm sure that brings yeah. lovely memories to many of us over this past year, and I'm sure none of us got on that cruise. Um, Caribbean Cruise Line um, was actually operating, which actually operates as Consolidated Travel Holdings Group out of Florida. They were making us unsolicited <laughs> telemarketing calls via an ADAD, to offer free cruises to the Bahamas in, um, in exchange for answering a survey. Uh, most of the Canadians that they contacted were on the list. And of note, this was a failed attempt for a company to rely on the exemption um, for making telecommunications made for the sole purpose of collecting information for a survey of members of the public, because it's not exactly what it was. Uh, earlier this year, on January 15th, the provisions regarding the installation of computer programs under Castle came into effect. Essentially, consent is required for the is, consent is required from the authorized owner or authorized user uh, prior to the installation of a computer program on their device. And with regards to cause the installation, of the CRTC seems to be concerned more with um, concealed software within the installation. Um, organizations could, you know, face some hefty fines. Um, and consent is deemed for many types of programs and, and scenarios, such as operating systems, cookies, JavaScript programs, executable to fix bugs later down the road. Um, consent is deemed only if it would be reasonable based on the owner or authorized user's conduct. As such, organizations need to be somewhat on the lookout for signals that would you know, suggest that the authorized user or owner is no longer consenting, such as if they block an easy example, of, right? As we know now, is that the authorized user is block cookies on the computer. <clears throat> there are some provisions and some confusion around whether there's uh, enhanced disclosure and consent requirements for programs that have intrusive 
uh, features such as it collects personal information or interferes with the user's control. However, only if these features are contrary to the reasonable expectations of the owner or authorized user. So while a user downloads an alarm clock app on their phone, and it also discloses that it will upload your contact addresses from your phone, while that feature may fall under collect personal information, it disclosed to the user that it was going to do that and cannot be said to be contrary to the reasonable expectations. They knew that when they downloaded the alarm clock app, it was going to upload their contact, their contact information from their book once it did so. So the CRTC appears to state that the mere inclusion of these types of features does not necessarily require enhanced consent, only if it is not to be expected by the user. Um, there is a withdrawal consent issue, but this will be limited to situations where organizations must provide assistance on, with an uninstall, uninstalling a program, um, primarily when the owner's or authorized user misinterprets the program's descriptions. Um, the main issue that's sort of creating these thorny issues with this new legislation is how do you get consent for upgrades and updates? Um, with regards to upgrades and updates, if the program is pre-installed by the owner or the authorized user, and the organization did not obtain consent to um, the, at the time of the installation to um, at, do those upgrades updates down the road, um, it becomes a little challenging how you get that consent down the road. Um, similarly, there is a challenge of getting consents for updates and upgrades from purchases um, who buy a used good from someone else. So the seller of a used item might have consented, but the new owner may not have consented. Imagine. <laughs> A manufacturer um, is pushing, uh, has, imagine a manufacturer of a vehicle has consent from me to push updates to my car for whatever fancy uh, software I have in my car, but then I sell my car. The manufacturer doesn't know that I sold my car and they continue pushing updates to the software without consent of the new owner of the car. So there are these, these concerns, these issues that we need to deal with. We haven't got uh, tons of guidance yet on how we can deal with these, but this is something on the radar that organizations need to think about not only just you know, policy-wise, organizational-wise, but like literally how we're going to make sure these things get through. Uh, the CRTC has stated that you know, in the context of CEMs, um, a business relationship can transfer to the new owner, um, such as if it, you know, the business is sold and in, within the purchase, uh, if it, the purchaser can rely on the express consent uh, obtained by the seller if the contract of sale includes such a provision. But with regards to installing computer programs, it's still unclear, and with regards to a transfer of ownership from the authorized owner, that's still un unclear. Um, and again, the onus to prove consent is on the installer, and thus organizations want to record all these consents um, as they do the inst installation. And that's it for me. Mm -hmm. So let's get back to more of the privacy developments. So Carla has talked about the privacy developments in CASEL. CASEL has a privacy component, much broader, as you've just heard, but there have been more privacy amendments this year. What I'm going to do is actually jump to uh, slide 16 here, mandatory breach notification. So mandatory breach notification is not yet in force, but because it requires some regulations still to be uh, passed. However, it's coming. Um, and what it does, it makes it compulsory for any organization that suffers a breach where there is real and significant harm, okay, risk of real and significant harm, there has to be notification to the OPC and to every person affected. Significant harm is defined in the Act, and it covers both psychological and financial and potential physical harm. And the time to notify is as soon as possible. So it's not a set timeline. It's as soon as you can find out who has been affected. And if the organization fails to notify every person who was affected, then the penalty is $100,000 per person who was not notified that should have been notified. The tips I would give you on that 
is that it's extremely important to have ahead of time in any organization criteria to make that decision. When do we notify? When do we consider that we have hit the threshold of real and significant harm? Because that is the organization that makes that call. Secondly, who within the organization makes that call? It's not the time to make it up. It has to be decided in advance. Which brings me to the second tip, have an anticipated breach response plan. I'm not going to ask a show of hand as to what organization here has one, because perhaps those who don't don't want to say they don't. What I'm going to say is this is extremely important. I saw it with LinkedIn. When LinkedIn had their breach in 2012, Because they had an anticipated breach response plan, they were fabulous at reacting. They knew exactly how to escalate the issue, who to escalate the issue to, who to get in gear, what was the team that was going to take care of it, and they did take care of everything. And so we didn't investigate because we thought there was really no point. We were in touch with them. We had conference calls every two weeks. There was no point. Accountability was met. Then um, another important point, information sharing among organizations. So since this is now in force, now organizations can, where it is reasonable and for the purposes of an investigation, share information with other organizations. And this is in the case of suspicions of obviously contravention of the law, breach of contract, etc., And there, two tips. Number one, every organization should have a definition of what it will regard as reasonable. And secondly, will have compliance mechanisms to make sure that that is respected. Because you could have Bill calling Joe saying, hey, I just wanted to tell you that we are investigating so-and-so, and totally informal, and if it does not meet the reasonableness of the act, then it could be a violation that will be the object of a successful complaint. Um, before I go to European Opera f- of Safe Harbor, I would also like to mention an important change in um, in PIPERA that came through the same, this is all S4. Uh, I'm looking at financial institutions, uh, in particularly relevant to them. A person who is uh, in the view of the organization being abused financially, the organization now clearly has the right to contact either law enforcement authorities or competent authorities or a next of kin to make sure that the person is protected, that the financial abuse is taken care of. That is not a violation of privacy. So that's an important change. With respect to safe harbor, now I will ask a show of hand. How many of you um, hold data in the U.S. in the sense that you have your organizations have data servers in the U.S.? How many of you then receive European data that you then would hold in the U.S.? Okay, what are you doing about the invalidation of safe harbor? Are you developing model clauses? Are you... You are BCR compliant. Oh, well then, you're fine. Beautiful, congratulations. Uh, So, what's happening in Europe? Safe harbor... (laughs) Safe harbor was the instrument... You can take the rest of the day off. You can... You, you just got a little star. My other choice is to go back up all day. Yeah. So, um, so, Safe Harbor was the instrument, the legal instrument through which European companies would transfer personal data to the United States. And any company in Canada that has data centers in the U.S., Many, except for those who that have BCRs, would have a data center in the U.S. that was safe harbor compliant, registered with safe harbor. 
Now that it's invalidated, then you don't have that legal instrument any longer. The issue is that Europeans do not allow personal data to get out of Europe unless to countries that have adequacy status. The U.S. do not have adequacy status because they do not have a data protection authority, they don't have a privacy commissioner, they don't have individual remedies for any violation of privacy. I could go into more details. The point is that it is not declared adequate, hence safe harbor was the substitution for adequacy. It is now gone, which means that to transfer data from Europe to the United States or via Canada to the United States, a a European company will now need either a model clause or a binding corporate rule, uh, BCR, or individual consent. And so those of you who do have that kind of arrangement will need to look into that. The Data Protection Authorities on October 16th, oh, this should read January 31st. I had my assistant correct it, but... I don't know how come it didn't, but this is January 31 here. Um, so the Data Protection Authorities of Europe have said until January 31, all European data going to the US via Canada or direct will be respected. But as of January 31, they will enforce the requirement for model clauses and binding corporate rules or individual consent. S 2016, it's it, completely wrong. It's January 1, 2016. Um, I had asked it to be corrected, and I don't know, I guess <laughs> it was the wrong, the, the wrong, uh, no, I think it was my handwriting. To be really, really honest, it was my handwriting. And when I saw the typo, I asked it to be corrected, and I don't know how come, I guess, uh, they fired off the wrong the wrong deck, but very important. January 21, 2016 is when the truce, so to speak, is lifted, okay? 31, 31, 2016, okay? Uh, and the Germans, though, since October 16th, the Germans dissociated themselves from that, being much harsher and saying, even then, uh, so first of all, from now until January 31st, 2016, they do not even recognize safe harbor. There is no truce in relation to Germany. So if you deal with German companies, they will need to look at alternatives to send you personal information if you store it in the US. And even then, the German data protection authorities, I say authorities plural because they are state level, have said that even then they will not accept model clauses or binding corporate rules because they consider that the U.S. is not a safe place to keep personal data and therefore they will require individual consent. So even you will have to look into other alternatives if you have business with Germany because the binding corporate rules could not be enough. But anyway, we can talk about that. Anyway, this is the important development I wanted to bring to your attention on Safe Harbor. So just to finish, and please ask questions as, uh, as they come to you, the big five game changes. Uh, first of all, frequency and impact of breaches. I don't need to tell you. We all watch the news, and we all know how spectacular and frequent the breaches are. But what I'd like to tell you is legally how does that change the picture. It changes the picture by shifting the obligation upon you and your organizations from what I would say unassailability to accountability or from security to resilience. What do I mean by that? It is clear that the attacks have become so sophisticated that at some point the organizations are victims. So the regulators are not looking for non-occurrence of attacks. They are looking for what did you do to prevent the attacks? Were your safeguards up to business standards? Were they appropriate in relation to the sensitivity of the information you hold? And how were they effective? 
And how did you respond when you had a breach? In other words, the test is no longer occurrence but accountability. Secondly, the complexity of information. So it was easy before. We would just write it on a piece of paper. We'd say I put it in a desk drawer, you know, keep the key somewhere else, etc. The complexity of information management means that your duty to openness must be adapted. What does success look like? Um, if you want a good tip, look at the results of the OPC International Internet Sweep of 2013. What we did then was to sit down with many other national data protection authorities around the world. Everyone on that same day decided to sweep the internet. Everyone took a series of companies and looked at their privacy policies. And we showed the result as the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good had very short, easy to read, prominent privacy policies. The bad had the ones that read like Hamlet except not good literature. And the ugly didn't even have privacy policies. So the picture of success is short, accessible, readable policies and make sure that the organization applies those policies very well connected, bottom to top. So really CEO all the way down to staff, as I said earlier, but also from side to side, which is what I mean by cybersecurity and privacy very well, hand in hand. The temptation of data is the other big impact changer. So, for example, business intelligence, online behavioral advertising. And this is where I'm going to talk about Bell Canada. So, um, Bell Canada in, announces in 2013 that they will amalgamate the information they have about their customers Billing information, name, telephone, region, um, internet, cable, and all, all that, to make a profile to send targeted person ads, okay, targeted ads. There was a huge level of protestation. In fact, we got over 100 complaints within two weeks. Were you with us at that point, Carl? Had you arrived? No? No. no? Okay. Well, you really missed some <laughs> juicy missed stuff. This was good. Anyway, also legally groundbreaking we'll because it clarifies, we'll swap stories after, okay, um, because it truly clarifies what the OPC expects in relation to online behavioral advertising and also on how you can use data. So this is what the OPC said. It was a violation of PIPEDA. Why? Because Bell Canada did not seek consent. Why should they have sought consent? Bell Canada says, look, they've given us all this information. No, the OPC says. They've given you all this information to get a service, not for the purpose that you are using it now, i.e. targeted advertising for service. So number one, you've got a different use. And secondly, they've already paid for God's sake. They pay for your service. It's not like Facebook where you should expect a level of advertising because that's the only way they can give you free Facebook. There, the level of expectation of privacy is higher and therefore the level of consent sought should be higher. So the picture of success um, if I had worked for Bell Canada, I would have said to them, well, first, let's do a privacy impact assessment. How intrusive will this be? Having determined that, finding out, for example, how much information was used, how defined were the profiles, and so on and so forth, then compare that to the law. Okay, so how risky is it in terms of privacy law? What is the assessment? And therefore, what would be the mitigation strategy? And the mitigation strategy would have been a very nice, cute little pop-up. Would you like to have ads that correspond to really what interests you? Yes or no? And this is how we're going to do it. And they probably would have had just as much success 
and well, actually, they didn't have any success. They canned it. They completely scrapped the the wrap. Well, that's what it was called. Um, but my point is that if they had done a privacy impact assessment, they would have had a map of their risks and they could have mitigated them. Other thing is effective anonymization. So business intelligence can be extremely helpful without identifiers. If you de-identify, so you want to know, your organization wants to know who are our customers, how do they shop, or how, for example, cookies, often cookies will tell an organization how visits to the website play out without any identifiers. That's fine. Anonymization meaning a segregation of identity that is so effective that re-identification is unlikely of remote possibility that can unlock the door to the use of the personal information for business intelligence. Meaning information for valid consent, that would have been terrific if uh, Bell had done that, for example. And also, very important, the uh, compliance monitoring. This comes from an investigation to Google. So Google uh, was uh, the object of a complaint from a Canadian who uh, discovered that his searches for an apnea device, therefore medical information, was tracked. They were tracked. And yet, Google clearly says you will not be tracked on the basis of sensitive information. Personal health information is sensitive. So, uh, complaint. Google, at the first step, said to us, no, 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 this is not us. This is a third-party advertiser, to which we said, well, it's your platform. Your platform, you're accountable. And what uh, Google found was that their compliance mechanisms, which were there to catch the third-party advertisers that did not follow the policy, were simply not up to snuff. So that investigation really brought to mind the importance of internal monitoring in relation to the use of data. So in short, this I would put to you as your checklist what you should go back to the office with and say, how do I support my organization? So first of all, make sure that your organization realizes what its privacy risks are. As the type of organization it is, as the kind of technology it has, as the sensitivity of the, the information it holds, and according to the kind of staff it has. Does it have highly educated, less educated staff, engaged staff, less engaged staff? So assess the risks. Obviously, you need to develop the corollary strategies. That needs to be done in the C-suite, absolutely as a matter of organizational risk management. Then openness, make sure that all of your practices are clearly, easily findable, and that you provide options. For example, cookies. You'll see lots of privacy policies says you can opt out of cookies. Obviously, you will not have all the services that this website can give you if you do, but you can. And so there is an opt out and you preserve control over the information. And finally, you need an organizational plan to take care of privacy. That means a governance structure. That means clear policies that are disseminated throughout the, inform the organization. That means an implementation structure that makes sure they are followed. And obviously, it means that your whole organization is brought around it as a matter of corporate liability, not just a discrete, separate issue. So this is really what I've seen um, on the basis of my experience as a regulator, now as external counsel. But I really would love to hear from you uh, questions, comments. Is there anything that Carl and I uh, can tell you more to make sure that uh, we address what you need to know? Is that on? Yep. Um, July 1st, 2017. It's a happy day for plaintiff class action lawyers. The rest of us are living in terror. Is, are those sections of CASEL actually going to be implemented? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. And then 
we will find out, I guess. Um, we have no, we have, uh, I don't know if the new government will, will make any changes um, if consumers are indeed not looking forward or are indeed feel that way about spam. Um, and that's the general opinion. I don't know if the new government will make any changes that I, I'm open to other people's opinions, but we are definitely thinking about that on the radar. And it was obviously being the news last week with that recent survey. But um, it's, a, it's a good thing to be concerned about. And hopefully there'll be more guidance, at least from CRTC. I and mean, they do have ample time to provide more guidance on that issue before that comes. But I don't foresee any changes yet. Yes. Um, with respect to online behavioral advertising, would you consider um, targeting an ad to an IP address if you don't have the, the IP address um, user information, that individual, you just have the address, the IP address, is that, do you, do you consider that to be anonymous enough or is that, uh, would that constitute a breach? Um, would you so, require consent, rather? Right. So it's more dependent on what you've used that pers as personal information. So let's say <laughs> the address is sent because this IP address is identified to be in Toronto and in this specific area of Toronto. And so that's how I'm sent, let's say, uh, advertisements for businesses that are in my area. And that's because it recognizes the IP address. Um, it is arguable because there, I remember at the OPC, our technologists were saying, well, look, it's very easy to link you to the IP address, mostly if you're the only one who uses the computer or if you have more than one user on the computer, but you have separate accounts. So personal information is information that is traceable to an identifiable individual. An IP address, if it can be traced to an identified individual, not necessarily, but if it is, then it is PI. That means it cannot be used without consent. It cannot even be collected without consent. So can, if you, with, with knowing that, tell me exactly the scenario you would have in mind, how this OBA would be pushed. Uh, so I'm not the ISP. Say I'm serving an ad to a user using mm -hmm. maybe Google's technology, uh, maybe someone else's. All I have is an IP address. Right. I don't hold that user's ISP account information. So I wouldn't have their name. I'm merely serving an ad to an address at a certain time or based on its preferences on our actions on our website. So if I know that the, in the afternoon they happen to look at a lot of um, articles about cars and yeah. I, I serve them an ad related to cars. Right. Um, a, a colleague here, you want to intervene? Because you have. No, no, I'm just thinking that maybe they would have purchased that, that, that list may have been purchased. That's it. Well, exactly. So there are a few ways that this occurs. I mean, there is online behavioral advertising that is contextual, and there is that is uh, behavioral and therefore truly corresponds to your personal business searches. I'm So as I'm listening to you, you're the company that serves the ads. The platform may have the personal information. So let's take our specific investigation of Facebook 2009. One of the allegations where we found Facebook was right was in relation to ads. So what the OPC said was, number one, a free service, lower expectation of, of, uh, ex of privacy, you should expect to receive ads. However, Facebook was not allowed to give the advertisers the personal information. What Facebook was allowed to do was to serve the ads of the advertisers. So say you're the advertiser, you sell cars, you tell Facebook, okay, we're in a contract, you push my ads according to the best possible strategy. Facebook has the information and pushes the ads to the people they know would be the best um, recipients of that uh, advertisement. So then I see no personal information. The, the pivotal point in your question is, 
whether the IP address you have can be traced to an individual. If the answer is no, you're in the clear. Absolutely. Does that help? <clears throat> yes, but that's a different thing. Exactly. So, so if we take the Facebook example again, um, so Facebook will know that they're sending the ad to me because I happen to be a bike fan and say, right? But the bike company that, put, that has a contract with Facebook or with Google don't. I mean, they auction time and they push their ads and it's the platform that targets and the platform already has the information. It does not disclose any personal information. So if that's the deal, then that has been deemed to be compliant. Do you want to intervene? So just from their perspective, but from Facebook's perspective, they need to have the same consent. Well, Facebook, uh, what we just said in, in 2009, is that Facebook uh, <laughs> can do that. It's a free Service. service. So lower our expectation of privacy if we take the Bell Canada case, no, but they cannot disclose. <clears throat> yes? Not so much a question as a topic uh, for discussion. All of this is predicated upon the concept of privacy. So stripping out anything sensitive like credit card numbers, social insurance number, credit <laughs> reports, we're left with a generational gap of the definition of privacy. I'm fairly active in protecting my privacy online with whatever device I use. The kids don't care. So do the regulators take into account the target demographic when they're assessing your management of your privacy within your organization? So the answer is yes. Uh, let me expand upon that a little bit. Our focus groups, precisely when we did the Facebook investigation in 2009, we did focus groups with youth. And uh, I watched one of those behind, you know, the, the window where they, they didn't know, I, the one-way mirror, whatever. Anyway, uh, so they would say things like, uh, we would say, do you care about privacy? Oh my God, do I care about privacy? Okay, how many friends do you have on Facebook? 800, 1,000. You see, there was a disconnect. And it was the typical recklessness of a young person. Just like when I was young, which I admit is beyond anyone was born here, but we would hitchhike. If you had asked me, Are you, do you care about your physical safety? I would have said, oh, of course I do. But then I would pull out my thumb and hitchhike. I just didn't make the connection that I was putting myself at risk. So, so first of all, the generational gap is um, not in terms of the visceral need to privacy, that is cross-generational, absolutely cross-generational. What is generationally and culturally and territorially and timely changing is the modalities of exercise of privacy. So, for example, you meet me in the morning and you ask me how I am. My right to privacy is to choose to reply either I'm fine, thank you very much, or tell you, well, actually, I'm really not doing well at all, I have a headache, whatever, you see? So the, I choose to exercise my right to privacy by the level of information I give you. That's a definition in Duarte, the Queen versus Duarte defined the right to privacy as the right to determine what information is disclosed about us. Okay? So, you can determine to tell the whole world about your whole life. It does not mean you've lost your right to privacy. It means you've exercised it that way. In relation to your question about children, so we've said Okay, they have a visceral need to privacy, but they're reckless about it. So what do we do? One specific investigation was Nexopia. It is on the OPC's website. Website specifically for youth. That was very poorly protected. Very poorly. And what we said to them was, not only do you have to have privacy settings for everyone, but they have to be 
age appropriate, meaning you know you're dealing with a vulnerable population because of their youth. Number two, you know that they are at a different cognitive stage than adults. Therefore, the principle of transparency and openness, those policies that have to be easy to read and prominent, they have to be so for youth. And in fact, the Canadian Marketing Association, they have their own ethics guidelines that specifically address youth. Do not target youth. And the OPC, we developed guidelines on OBA to youth, and we said, we didn't put an age number, but we said, look, there are consent issues there, so stay away. How do you ascertain that a young person has expressed consent? Which is why, for example, there's the 13 years cut off age on so many websites. So it's a long-winded answer to your question. Yes, absolutely, youth is taken into account because it is pivotal to the issue of consent. So they, they say wrap up. She says wrap up. Do you want to add something? There's a big, there's a big slide behind all of you that's saying wrap up. Wrap up. So I don't know what it means. No. Uh, <laughs> um, just, uh, I guess we should wrap up. And uh, I, there, <laughs> there are two little points I just want to mention first. The sign up sheet is up here if you guys have not signed up already. And also, you're all welcome to join us on the seventh floor for a cocktail reception, uh, where David Allgood will be making some opening remarks. And that starts right now, I believe. So thank you very much. All right, thank you.